Good morning, uh, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Uwe Naumann from Aachen University in Germany. Uh, I'm also the, the acting program director of the SIM activity group on applied and computational discrete algorithms. And today, and also to, together with my fellow organizers, uh, who are uh, Anne Benoit from UNS de Lyon, Blair Sullivan from University of Utah, and Julian Schoon from MIT, I, I welcome you all to this first online seminar uh, of our activity group. The plan is to run uh, these seminars regularly, aiming to cover topics of interest to the members of the activity group and, and others. Um, this goal will certainly be met by the presentation uh, of the speaker of the following inaugural lecture. Um, we're very happy to welcome uh, Catherine Yellick from the University of California Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, and I will hand over to Julian uh, to introduce her in more detail. Julian, over to you. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, <clears throat> hi, so I'm very happy to have um, Kathy Yellick as the speaker for today. Um, Kathy is the Robert S. Pepper Distinguished Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, as well as the Executive Associate Dean in the Division of Computing Data Science and Society at UC Berkeley. Kathy is also a senior faculty scientist at Lawrence uh, Berkeley National Labs, and her research focuses on high performance computing, programming systems, parallel algorithms, and computational genomics. And she currently leads the Expo, Exobiome project on exascale solutions for microbiome analysis. Um, previously, Kathy was a director of uh, uh, NERSC from 2008 to 2012. And, also led the computing sciences area at Berkeley Labs from 2010 to 2019. Um, she earned her PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT and is also a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's a fellow of the ACM and the AAAS and she is a recipient of the ACM IEEE Ken Kennedy Award and the ACMW Athena Award. And um, starting in January, 2022, uh, Kathy will be the Vice Chancellor of Research at UC Berkeley. And today Kathy is going to be telling us about her work on genomic analysis at scale and how to map irregular computations to advanced architectures. So I'll turn it over to you, Kathy. Great. Well, thank you very much, Julian, and thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to speak. Um, let me just confirm before I go further that everybody can hear me and see my slides still. Okay. Yeah. Um, great. So, um, and I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, the Exobiome project, or at least uh, talk about some algorithms, parallel algorithms, and some of the computational biology algorithms that arise in this project. And um, it is part of the Department of Energy's Exascale Computing Project. But on this picture, I have both this building in the front here, which is the Lawrence Berkeley Lab Computing Sciences Building. And then down below, you can see the Berkeley campuses because this work is largely done um, at the lab, but certainly involves many of us that go back and forth between the two. Um, the Exascale Computing Project has uh, over 20 application projects, and this is one of them looking at uh, microbial uh, data analysis problems. So without more uh, kind of further background, let me just start with a little bit about what the application problem is here. It's really to help understand the microbiome. I think everybody is aware of the importance of the microbiome and understanding health, but it's also really critical to the environment. Things like um, carbon capture, how carbon is released and captured from various, whether it's in the ocean or in soil and things like that. Um, so some of the questions that come up among the biologists are, um, you know, who, that is what species exist in various microbial communities communities, what are they doing, why are they, you know, kind of doing it, what, what function do they have, and how. And so um, the, the, in doing genomic analysis at scale, as with many of these other scientific problems, there's a combination of very large data sets, and here there's a picture of a a very standard graph, which is the cost for, for human genome to sequence that genome. We're not going to be talking about human genomes, but about microbial genomes. But nevertheless, this is a good metric for seeing uh, the exponential improvement in the cost of 
uh, of the, the data collection from sequencing, uh, big machine. So there's a picture of the, the supercomputer Cori at NERSC, which is where a lot of this work was done, as well as one of the computers at Oak Ridge National Labs that I'll mention later. And, um, and, but in order to put this all together, we need highly par scalable parallel algorithms. And, and by the way, um, this can't be done without algorithms application problems. So there are many cases where we're going to optimize uh, for the specific application. So just to give a few examples quickly of the science questions that come up. So, um, you know, one of the questions is what happens to microbes after a wildfire? And the size of the data set there is uh, one and a half terabytes. Um, another example of a large data set, big data in science, is what happens to um, how do carbon um, and metabolism change in freshwater over a period of 17 years? That's a 26 terabyte data set. Um, some of the data sets that were, and both of those are things that we've already uh, worked on analyzing. Some that we're looking forward to analyzing in the future. One of them is from an oceans um, data set that was collected over a period of, um, of years and has 35,000 samples and 84 terabytes of data. Um, this is collecting all the microbial communities in the ocean, or another example, and the human microbiome is actually analyzing together most of the known human microbiome data, which is in the um, sequence archive is about 100 terabytes of data. So those are some of the examples of big data problems that we're looking at. And um, let me just say that as you're, I'm sure, familiar with from the within the area of deep learning that we've been able to get much better results by combining lots of computing power with lot very large data sets and in some cases still traditional algorithms and that it kind of idea of being able to combine big data um, with big computing in order to get better information also happens in this genomics area and this graph which is maybe a little specific to the domain is looking at the um, the cumulative length of the output, that is um, how, how large is the assembly, the, the, how, the, the total amount of, of data that we're able to analyze is really what you can think of that y-axis as being. And the dash line here is um, looking at a, the reference genome. So this is taking a data set that has a known answer to it and trying to figure out how well our tools are actually finding that answer. And what you can see is that with this blue line, which is what we call co-assembly, where we take these enormous data sets and try to analyze them as a single data set, asymptotes to the right answer. Whereas if you try to just analyze each individual data set, you can, you can get a lot of information out of it, but you actually sort of overshoot the actual answer because you end up with a lot of duplicates. And even if you run deduplication algorithms on it, you, you really can't get to something that, that gets you closer to the correct answer. So bottom line is better quality science um, in addition to being able to handle larger data sets, but it's really from the combination of larger data sets and larger computing. And this is really another uh, much more detailed um, graph that looks at one of these large data sets. This is work done um, by the, the PI on this is Jennifer Petridge at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, um, along with the team at the Joint Genome Institute and her research team using some of our tools to analyze um, this, this very large environmental um, data set and looking at the species that come out of it. And some of these species, the ones with arrows next to them, are only ones that you could find if you're looking at over a terabyte of data at once. And some of them are actually, one of them in particular is, is rare and ha had not been seen in this particular type of environment before. So just also highlighting the idea that these large data sets can give you new insights in the science. Now, it's not just about the size of the data sets, it's, a, it's also about the amount of time. And over the period of this project, um, and I'm going to talk when I talk about the algorithms, about how we've made these algorithms go much faster on HPC systems, um, if you, you can look at the total amount of, um, we, we have a sort of funny number, which is the bytes assembled per second. So this is looking at the, the size of the input data set. And um, these are somewhat normalized in, in the sense that there's similar types of data sets. These are things like soil or other environmental samples. And um, if you compare a couple of data sets that have roughly equal numbers of processing nodes, so this is the number of nodes on the X axis, you can see that over a period here of about five years, we've, we've increased the uh, performance of this by about 250 X on an equal node count. There's different hardware, um, but these are both 
Um, these were sort of standard HPC nodes of the different times. So as part of that is faster, faster nodes, but part of that is also algorithms that can take advantage, for example, the features on the newest nodes in 2021, which include graphics processing units or GPUs. So that's a little bit about the big data um, and the science behind it. And let me say a little bit about um, the large machines that are that we're looking at today. Um, I, I don't think I need to remind anybody here in the audience about the um, end of Denard scaling, which is really what led to multi-core processors. Um, so that frequency, the blue the cyan squares there in the middle, that really leveled off in around 2005. And, um, and then instead the increase in the number of logical cores. And we're also, um, and yet Moore's law has actually continued, although we also are seeing the tapering off of Moore's law as we get to um, smaller and smaller transistor sizes. And this has implications in science domains as well. The one example I like to point to here is from the Atlas experiment at CERN, which was um, had a um, calculation of the amount of computing that would be required after an upgrade of the Large Hadron Collider. And they underestimated the cost of computing by a billion dollars because the assumption was that uh, computing would continue to improve its capability, the, the computing per dollar would continue to improve over time as it had exponentially in the past. And it's that has slowed down as well. So what do these architecture looks like? It look like in particular in the DOE exascale computing program, which is what is funding, as I said, the exabiome project. Well, we started, I was very involved um, years ago in, in putting together with the other labs and with DOE, the plans for the exascale program. And in about 2008, when we were looking at options for building an exascale computer, you could say, well, let's assume that we put 10 times more um, 10 times more power in the um, computing facility, which is what the assumption was. At the time, we were looking at computers that had on the order of, say, two to three megawatts. So we were assuming that we would need 20 to 30 megawatts. That and actually more have been put into the centers for exascale computing, probably in the order of 30 to 50 megawatts. Um, so we're looking for a factor of 100 then from these other kinds of tech, uh, architectural techniques and algorithmic techniques combined. And this, there's, um, you know, what maybe the most obvious thing to do is to make the clocks run 100 times faster. We knew back in 2008 that was not going to be an option. The other swim lanes, if you will, the other competing technologies were 100 times more cores or using some type of accelerator such as GPUs. And today, actually, all three of the major systems coming into the Office of Science, and there are other systems going into the NNSA labs, um, including similar ones to these, but the three Office of Science labs that were uh, science machines are all using GPU architectures. So these are massively parallel machines. All of them use a, a network that comes from HPE. Formerly, that network was designed by Cray, so familiar to many of us in terms of the, um, the type of, of network there, although a somewhat different technology. Um, the, the GPUs are actually all different architectures. So they all have a combination of CPU and GPU nodes. The Perlmutter system at NERSC, which is a pre exascale system, is um, NVIDIA GPUs. Frontier and um, Aurora are going to be respectively AMD and Intel GPUs. And worrying about portability across these different GPU architectures is one of the things we've also worried about in the project. There are a lot of accelerators in the top 500 list. This just is one of the standard graphs from that. Um, project looking at how the, the, the growth, and you can see uh, 150 or so of the machines in the top 500 list, even as of 2020, had accelerators. And the other trend we're starting to see, and you can look at GPUs as kind of the first step in this direction, is more specialization. So GPUs obviously started as something designed for graphics and have become a much more general, you know, and sometimes people will say GP, GPU for general purpose uh, GPUs. But um, I think we're going to see more specialization in the future. And certainly we're seeing that now a lot in deep learning sort of our, uh, for deep learning workloads. And that's maybe my one last comment about this architectural trend towards specialization is I do worry that there's a tremendous focus on deep learning algorithms, obviously very important for a lot of different, um, a lot of different application domains, both in science and, uh, and in commercial applications. But if you look at the history of the high performance LINPAC benchmark, that top 500 benchmark, I think that 30 years ago, it may have been that the 
dense LU factorization at a very large scale was not a bad proxy for some of those scientific applications, but today, very few codes actually do that kind of dense linear algebra at that scale. They certainly use dense linear algebra and um, and they run at very large scales, but they don't solve sort of a single, for example, um, an order n cubed algorithm uh, across the entire machine because it's it's off it's very expensive. So there's a lot of other algorithmic techniques that have come into play, and I'm just worried that we're a little bit too focused on a pretty narrow class of algorithms right now when it comes to looking at hardware and software together and algorithms together. The one other thing that has in some sense remained constant, but actually is getting worse is the cost of data movement. Um, this looks at the cost per joule of moving data around various levels of the memory hierarchy relative to the cost of a single floating point operation. And you can see that um, to get anything off of the chip is orders of magnitude more expensive in terms of the energy. It is also orders of magnitude more expensive in terms of time. And if you look at the total time for a computation as the floating point operation cost uh, per, per op times the number of um, floating point operations, or in my case, because I'm doing genomics, those could be integer operations. Uh, the message cost, startup cost alpha times the number of messages and the bandwidth and a similar formula then for words moved from memory, whether they're contiguous in memory or separate, say separate cache lines that are jumping from different addresses in memory and can be streamed as well. And this is just looking at the, the trends in how those numbers have improved over time, but you can see that something like network latency is way up here at the top. Um, it's, ex it's improved exponentially, but not nearly the same kind of growth curve as something like um, the cost per operation. And that cost per operation has continued to benefit from on-chip parallelism, so not just from clock rates. So um, in my kind of one other opinion about this, um, this accelerator space looking at things like GPUs is I think accelerators are going to be increasingly important, um, something that even in the genomics area, there are many opportunities because of the types of algorithms, the types of data that we're looking at for much more specialized hardware architectures um, what I'm not happy about right now is the decoupling between the GPU, excuse me, and, and the CPU, and the fact that, for example, um, the CPU is is tends to be in charge of the computation and in charge of things like communication. And having the CPUs, which are really fairly low low performance relative to the GPUs or other accelerators in charge of the communication means that you've got this bottleneck really trying to do communication, say GPU to GPU. The, the, the approach is gonna to be to try to put as much of the computation as possible onto the accelerators and then to have to go back through the CPU in order to communicate is, is um, one of the challenges on many of the architectures. And I think we'll, we're seeing some trends that will improve in this direction. And this is just a, <coughs> sorry, a small benchmarking study, micro benchmarking study we did looking at that cost. <clears throat> I think in the interest of time, I won't go in it except to say that there is still even in doing GPU to GPU communication, um, there can be substantial overheads because of the involvement of the CPU in synchronizing. And that shows up in both latency and in bandwidth. <clears throat> so to summarize the hardware trends, um, we have you know more specialization, certainly more fine-grained parallelism. A lot of that is data parallelism, whether you're talking about a GPU or say a wider SIMD unit, um, as well as more cores, and um, but, that, but much more costly or relatively costly communication, whether you're talking about latency bandwidth or the total bisection bandwidth across the machine, and much many more levels, including software controlled levels of the memory hierarchy. So let's really look in the last category, which is the second half of my talk, really thinking about um, these parallel algorithms. <clears throat> so I'm gonna focus most of the time on what we call um, metagenome assembly, which is the problem of taking raw sequencing data, which are called reads, um, and turning them into long contiguous um, sequences that are you know, evil, either equal to the entire genome or more likely in the current technology are long segments of that, that genome so that you can do things like identify the genes in it, that are in it, hopefully identify the species and so on. So we're trying to get from these fragments, which by the way, the reads also have errors in them that come from the sequencing process and turn them into a corrected and nearly complete genome. And when we're talking about metagenome data, so something like a soil sample, 
um, this is going to have different species all mixed together in the reeds because there's all these species in that sample and they're not separated um, through a chemical process or anything uh, up front. So the steps in the assembly are to chop them into fixed length string called camers, to count those camers and throw out the ones that, are, uh, that appear with low frequency. The assumption is that every part of the genome that you care about every, and every species has been sequenced more than, a, more than once, and you should therefore have multiple copies of it, and hopefully more than two or three times so that you can tell, even if you've got some incorrect copies of a particular region, you can find enough good copies to basically outvote any, um, any errors. You then walk through this and turn it into what are called contigs, um, connecting those camers together. We'll then try to extend those by going back and running alignment between the original reads and try to glue the contigs together um, and, um, and then run something called scaffolding. And I'm not gonna talk about these algorithms in, in detail except for the camer process and a little bit about contig generation and alignment. And um, this is one of the reasons for that. If you look at the breakdown of time, um, what you can see here is that most of the time, the time is dominated by camer counting or what we call K count, the red bars here, um, as well as alignment, that, that um, third stage in there, this, the green bar, and the um, local assembly time, which is going to involve um, some of these same steps, both camer counting and alignment, as well as um, some contig generation and things like that, that I will talk briefly about. So I won't say quite as much about local assembly. It's actually quite a complex algorithm kind of it's kind of taking that whole pipeline and doing it now in a local processor on a local region of the um, of that sequence data um, and this this data is taken from four different data sets and run on four different node counts so the n equals 1 8 32 and 256 are the different node counts of the machine that it's running on and this is a roughly weak scaling sort of problem if you divide the data set size that's in parentheses there by the node count. It's not exactly a constant, but they're sort of same order of magnitude. And so um, what you see though, is that for example, the communication costs and things like that on the larger node counts will make other sections of the code such as camera counting more significant and, um, and some other uh, and uh, local assembly also becomes more significant. Now, because I don't really have time and you probably don't have an interest in learning all about um, the algorithms inside of assembly. I'm going to use a technique we've used a lot in scientific simulation of, of looking for some common patterns that come up and talk about how we parallelize those patterns. And the, the phrase that was coined by Phil Colella years ago was the seven dwarfs of simulation. And on the left-hand side, you may see things for more of the floating point um, community, you know, dense and sparse linear algebra, particle methods, uh, spectral methods, and so on, that are very common sort of uh, patterns of parallelism that come up in those applications. And um, yes, I'm happy to answer any questions that come up. I think if somebody raises their hand um, in, the, uh, in Zoom, then I can, I can go ahead and answer them. Now, on the right-hand side is a more recent um, set of what are called the seven giants of big data. Um, that was from a National Academies report that was put together. And I would say this is a pretty good list, although from my experience, I would take out linear, um, sorry, take out optimization and integration and replace them with hashing and sorting as kind of more fundamental low-level building blocks of big data analysis. Not that um, these other techniques aren't important, but they're built out of lower level algorithms that um, we can then worry about how to parallelize those. So one of the reasons to look at these, these motifs, if you will, more general term, rather than the dwarfs or giants is to, uh, to help us uh, when we wanna think about algorithms or we're interested in thinking about software te techniques or hardware, even what type of hardware will be a good match for this um, is to look at these common patterns that come up. And I will say that these, the patterns on the right come up all over the place in genomics algorithms, even though I'm gonna talk mostly about this assembly, I'll, I'll say a little bit about some of the other places that it comes up in other exabiome projects as well. So here's another version of those seven motifs. And um, the, some of the applications we're working on in exabiome include assembly, um, but we also compute distances between different data sets, uh, different metagenome data sets, clustering, um, whether you're clustering based on 
the output of the assembler to try to find common, the, which are the same species, clustering different proteins to figure out what proteins are related to another. So after you've coded for the genes, you can do that and annotate for um, looking for optional um, annotation of the, of the genomes. And all of this is being done on distributed memory platforms and including things with GPUs. I will just comment one more comment, I guess, on the architectures that when we started, when I started the Exabiome project and the, or the team did, um, we were really expecting to focus on more of a many core um, architecture with lots of cores, but not necessarily lots of data parallelism in it. And that, that, and you'll see that some of the algorithms that I'll talk about here don't seem like a natural fit for kind of pure, kind of rigid data parallelism, but it turns out that we have been able to map them effectively onto GPUs. So let's talk about hashing. So as I mentioned briefly in looking at the, the assembly pipeline, and this comes up in, in several of the other genomics applications, you often want to find all of the um, fixed length substrings or camers from this. So this picture shows um, formers, which is a ridiculously short size for a camer. We're, we're gonna look at something more like 51 MERS or even larger in the assembly process, but just for the purposes of PowerPoint, Here's, um, these are some input sequences. So think of these as the input reads and then all of the cameras that exist within them. So we need to parse them and we're going to compute a camera by the way at every single position. So these are not just um, you know, K up distance apart. This is at every, every single position because we're going to use them to glue the strings back together essentially by looking for overlap. So we're, what, the first thing that we do is we count the, the number of occurrences of each one of those camers. And that is used, as I mentioned before, to throw out ones with, that have low counts um, because they're probably errors. And we can do other sorts of analyses on them. Sometimes we just use the camer profile, the histogram, if you will, of the metagenome sample as a way of just characterizing that sample and being able to compare, for example, two histograms to, um, to each other to figure out whether the samples are, are similar or where, where there are differences between them based on where the camers are very different. So we make a hash table of those camers and it could be that we're going to just um, we're just going to save the count. Um, as I said, we might use that to remove the singletons. We can also sit, store the left and right extensions. That is the characters that, that were before and after that camer as it appeared in the original input string. So if you, if you store the extensions, then it's easy to walk through this and view the camers as a graph in which you've got these, these long strands where you pick up one camer, you add its, say, its right extension, shift the camer over by one, and then look that up in the hash table. And in this way, the hash table with its extensions will also represent a graph. And that's what we'll use um, as, as the next step in the assembly process. Now we're also going to use for these large scale distributed memory machines. And because something like a hash table is sort of my canonical example of where, I, and I wouldn't say that you can't write this in send receive, you absolutely can write something like this in send receive. You can also write it with collectives. And I'll say a little bit about that. But it's but if you think about building or looking up things in a hash table, it's a naturally asynchronous thing to do. That is, the, I am a you know processor, whatever. It has a certain camer. It needs to be inserted or looked up in a hash table. That hash table is distributed across the processors. The processor on the other side has no information about the fact that 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 I this processor want to look up something um, that is owned in your memory. And for that reason, having the ability to directly read and write memory on the other processor can be a really useful construct. And so we are building this on top of what are often called partition global address space or PGAS languages. We're using something called UPC++, which was also developed at Berkeley Lab and um, also supports, in addition to remote read and write, you have atomics and RPCs. So let's look at the distributed algorithm here. And this picture really looks, makes it look like a bulk synchronous problem. Each processor has a subset of the input. It's going to read that and parse it into camers. It's then gonna put it, it's gonna compute some kind of a hash-like function on it to determine which processor is going to own the final piece of that, uh, what, which, which processor owns the camer uh, hash table buckets that it, that that belongs into. So you're sort of bucketizing it um, based on processor ID, uh, based on the result of that hash function. You can do this in a bulk synchronous manner by by parsing a bunch of things, putting them all into buckets, and then doing a big all-to-all -all V exchange in MPI. 
Um, you can also do it asynchronously by saying, well, each processor is going to build a little outgoing buffer um, for each one of the, the, the cameras that are going to a, an, another remote processor, or it can be done at the node level. And, um, and then as soon as that, that bucket fills up, we'll just ship it off to the other processor and then continue by building another bucket there. So both of those can be used, um, and we've we, we, I'll show some results that that compare the two approaches. So this is, as I said, bulk synchronous, but this remote kind of bucket one at a time idea, which is a much more asynchronous communication model, can also be used. So this compares the Kamer counter in our assembler, which is called Meta Hitmer. Um, with the MPI all to all implementation, that's the MPI, and it has Bloom filter in it. Um, so, you know, one of the things that you may immediately recognize is if you're trying to, to, if you're going to eliminate the singletons because they're probably errors, then one of the first things you might want to do is throw them out so you don't say use a bunch of memory in your hash table storing singletons that are not useful to the assembly process because they're errors. And so um, you can use Bloom filters. It turns out, at least the way um, that this is implemented, if you if you um, you end up building the Bloom filter first, and then using that that distributed Bloom filter, so it's also a distributed sort of hash like data structure. Um, so hopefully, if people are familiar with the idea of Bloom filters in this statistical data structure, um, but because it can also be very large, it's also distributed. So you end up with two sort of separate rounds of not, I mean, within each round, there's multiple communication steps, depending on how much data you have, but you end up with two of those phases, one to build the Bloom filter, and then one to build the hash table, where you only store things that make it through the Bloom filter. And that adds, it's, that it basically doubles the overall cost, including the communication cost. Um, and so compared to that, the asynchronous algorithm in UPC++, the red line is um, significantly faster, you can see um, between these, um, the two different implementations. If you turn off the Bloom filter, um, you also can save even more time, which is the yellow line at the bottom. And in fact, in production, we have until recently been running without the Bloom filter. We've just within the last month or so added a counting quotient filter and now can do the filtering and the hash table construction, uh, although it's two different data structures in a single communication round. And that has, um, so that has substantially helped both our memory footprint um, relative to the version without Bloom filters and then the running time relative to the version with Bloom filters. Now, this doesn't, that, that's all about the distributed memory problem. And this doesn't sound like something that very naturally fits with a data parallel or sort of a GPU style computation. And, um, but it turns out that you can count cameras pretty well in a single GPU if that's all you, you have, and um, and this is some work that was led by um, Isrit Nissa when she was a postdoc at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And what you see on the left is the breakdown in time for just the camera counting phase. So really the same uh, algorithmic phase that I talked about in the previous slide, where uh, the, the actual counting that's done locally on a processor is this yellow bar. The communication time is this little red sliver. And the time to parse and sort of bucketize them is the blue that that blue bar and this is running on a 64 nodes um, and this is all on cpu core with multiple cores per node but this is running on and this it is a multi-core optimized code in this case on the left so um, after her work which did an, a work both to gpu optimize the counting but also to optimize the uh, parsing and processing the, the total running time shrank substantially. So you can see the y-axis here has gone from a, a, P, a maximum of 4,000 to a maximum of 40. And the, the little red communication time is actually constant, but now is the dominant cost of camera analysis. So this was over 100x speed up, which is great. Um, and now we have a different, um, a different problem to optimize, which is communication. And as I said, this is a common theme that comes up and both from uh, in HPC algorithms in general, but also when you add GPUs to something, you take something that was a compute pro bound problem and make it a communication bound problem. So what do you do about the communication? Well, um, if you go back and look at, the, um, at what we're, we're actually trying to do here, we're sending these little camers, which really blows up the size of the data set by almost a factor of K, right? Because we've, we've computed a camer at every single position, a little bit less because there aren't complete camers at the end of the sequence. But, um, but nevertheless, you're getting an enormous blow up in the size of the data set. And that, by the way, this is the high watermark for in terms of memory usage in the entire assembly process. 
because at this point we have all this raw data and we've blown it up by a factor of almost K and we don't know sort of what's useful and what's not. So um, the, the technique that is used is to, first of all, build a better hash function that is based on, say, the, the lexicographically smallest substring within the k-mers. And um, as I mentioned, a k-mer might be 51 characters long. So you might, and this shows an even smaller sort of substring, like a former as what we call the um, minimizer. And that will give us, that will tend to put all of the KMERS that came from a certain part of the region of the genome on the same processor. And so um, that will give us better locality for later phases of the assembly algorithm. And it also means that the packing that we're doing beforehand is more efficient. But moreover, if we are clever about it and we recognize that we don't actually need to parse these things and completely um, kind of blow them up by a factor of K, we can send the longer substring and then parse them on the remote side. And that's what happens with these super MERS. And you can see the speed up here just from this communication cost, the communication um, optimizations from using these minimizers and super MERS. Um, on these two data sets. And this is also on a 64 node of the Summit machine at Oak Ridge, which is um, NVIDIA GPUs on it. And so now the, now the overall speed up is much, much uh, um, approved on top of the 100X that we got from the, um, from the GPU optimizations. So the next step after you've done this camera analysis in, the, um, in this assembler in MetaHitmer is to treat the hash table with the left and right extensions as a graph um, and walk through that graph using a depth first search. And it's, it's a parallel depth first search. We can start at any camera. So every processor can start with any particular camera that it happens to own in its hash table and start walking either left or right from there. And um, so that is, um, so, so an edge in this graph is any um, overlap of K minus one, but it's really represented quite well in the hash table. You just have to look up the, the, the extension and then rehash it in order to take a step in walking through the depth first search. And by the way, we've thrown out all the branches at this point in that camera analysis phase as well. So there's a little bit more to it that I didn't talk about. Um, and so we, at this point, we just have a lot of chains as our graph, and we're just trying to figure out what those chains are. And each processor can start at a different point and do its own walk, as I said, both to the left and to the right. However, they can run into each other because these processors are, uh, these, these cameras are spread out all over the place on the machine. And so there's a non-trivial synchronization problem that comes up. And this graph walk is done asynchronously, um, you know, and written with these kinds of, um, uh, the kind of sort of um, RDMA based, you know, one-sided communication algorithms and so on. Now, in order to, and it's described by the way, this is Evangelos Yorganis's PhD thesis and is described both in his thesis and in an SC18 paper. Um, but there are things you can do to improve locality here. One of them I've already talked about, which is to use a hash function that is better. And I'll say more about that in a minute. The other thing you can do when you're doing lookups on this is, to, is caching. Now it turns out in this particular phase, when you're walking through this, um, caching doesn't help you very much because there's very little reuse of the, the um, cameras. And so um, it's really not worth caching. But in later phases of assembly, where we're also looking things up in the hash table, including cameras, um, then there, there is better reuse. And so we'll use caching when it helps and not when it doesn't. Um, there, you can come up with a better, better sort of um, a hash function, which gives you better locality. And um, this is actually is done in another way besides the minimizers, which is if you know the answer, that is, you know what you're, what you're assembling for, um, then you can design a hash function that's going to put contiguous regions of the final genome on, um, on the same processor. And therefore, once you've done an initial phase of moving the, the reads around or the cameras around actually from those reads, you're going to get better, um, you're going to get good spatial locality after that and therefore a lot more um, reuse as well. And so if you're doing something like assembling the human genome, which you can also do with our um, with our assembler, um, and you, but you know it's a human genome, you can use a hash function that's designed for the human genome. And even though this human genome is a little different than every other one, that'll give you a very good sort of approximate final genome, which gives you a good, um, a good initial hash function. 
And um, within the metagenome case, I didn't really mention this, but there's an outer loop in which we're going to um, try different camera sizes and there's and the results of one size are fed into another. And what that means is the first stage, it tends to be very slow because we don't have a good hash function. But at that, after that point, we build a hash function that is reflective of what we learned about the assembly from that first step. And, um, and that improves the locality considerably for later steps. And you can see there's these kinds of techniques do give you significantly um, improved communication performance. Okay, so um, that's really uh, now looking at the first two phases of assembly, the camera analysis, this histogramming and counting, um, and hashing, and then, the, um, and then the graph walk where you really view the hash table as a graph. The next phase that comes up, if you remember from the overall picture, is to align the original reads back to what are called contigs that came out of that graph walk, those contiguous sections of the, those lines of the graph. And this is where we deal with a lot of ambiguity and things like that. There may be redundant regions of the genome that will show up as little fragments that we couldn't have assembled using the, the previous technique because there were all these branches in the graph graph at that point. So we'll go back and do alignment from the original input reads. This is a Smith-Waterman style dynamic programming algorithm that is used on what at this point what we're trying to do is to align with imperfect string matching a um, a read, so the the you know which may have errors in it, it may have insertions, deletions, and flipped uh, flip characters, and so on, and align that against a contig, which is most likely correct because of all the analysis, the error, error analysis, and elimination that was done. Those contigs that are, are actually correct. So we have, but we have a large number of pairwise alignments to do. Potentially, it could be all contigs against all reads. So the Smith-Waterman algorithm itself, in the worst case, is an order n squared algorithm. In practice, we don't run full Smith-Waterman. We use something like a banded Smith-Waterman, which will only look for alignments near the diagonal. Because if it's, a, if it's an alignment that is very poor, has a very poor score, which means it's not, far, not close to the diagonal, which would be a perfect match, then it's not interesting because that means that that, that region, that, that read does not actually map to that contig. And so, um, we will use uh, faster algorithms that that is um, that has a limited band to it. For some, for one of the other assemblers that I'll uh, just mention briefly, which is called Alba, um, uh, which is being built for much longer read technology, and your. Um, we all we actually use a different algorithm called XDROP that more dynamically searches this space based on when the score changes significantly. So we don't use you know a, a naive n squared algorithm. Nevertheless, um, in aggregate, the alignment cost is very high. And um, so we've also GPU optimized all, all of these algorithms. This is looking at both the the, um, the Smith Waterman sorts of um, algorithms and um, running it on the, the code here, which is built um, by Moaz Awan at NERSC is, um, is, uh, can run on, on one or multiple GPUs. And so the first three bars here are the GPU optimized code. And we're looking at giga cell updates per second. So think of the dynamic programming matrix. And by this way, this is done on batches of alignments because this individual alignment, each of the input reads, I should have mentioned this is about 150 characters. And so you just don't have enough parallelism in that, even though that computation can be parallelized, it's really important to parallelize across um, a whole batch of alignments as well. And um, the two bars on the right, the cyan and the, and the dark blue are the, the um, multi-core performance. And you can see that the uh, GPU performance is um, significantly better, at least with, uh, with multiple GPUs. Um, this is the kind of um, scaling that we get. And I haven't talked about all of these algorithms, but this is now running on the GPU optimized code. And this is the full assembler for MetaHitmer. Um, MetaHitmer overall is built by Steve Hoffmeyer, um, building on top of the code that Evangelos Yorganis built um, as part of his PhD thesis. But a lot of work has been done since then, including a complete rewrite. Um, and you can see that um, it scales quite well, even up to a thousand nodes. And these are GPU nodes and the, the camera phase the um, alignment phase, excuse me, and the um, local assembly phase um, have all have uh, are highly GPU optimized, and each one of those have benefited, especially local assembly and camera analysis. Alignment, surprisingly to me at least, doesn't doesn't speed up as much, and I, I will say a little bit more about that in a minute. So let me just look at the time here. Um, 
Great. So, um, and this is just looking at the time breakdown um, for the CPU versus the GPU code. So there is a bit of a shift um, with some of the things like uh, that have not been optimized, like content generation, the, the um, golden bars there becoming more substantial just relative to the things that really sped up from the optimizations. And the overall running time is substantially faster on the GPUs. And this just shows kind of the same type of information. All this, sh this shows you the speed up that we get just from the GPUs in each of these. I will say that in the alignment phase here, so this is each of the four major or the three, three major pieces that have been GPU optimized. So the camera counting I talked about in uh, quite a bit of, de you know, of detail, alignment uh, only briefly a little bit and talking about adapt in this multi um, this batch aligner that runs on GPUs. And then local assembly includes that contig generation step as well as camera analysis and alignment uh, within the local assembly. And um, you can see the, the kind of speed ups that we're getting for GPU optimizations. And once again, this is running on multiple different node counts. It's the same graph that I, that, you know, the same data sets that I showed before. So what we didn't really talk about in alignment is where does the rest of the time go other than running Smith-Waterman? And the answer is you can't afford to run a Smith-Waterman style algorithm, even if you use a better algorithm um, that is cutting off the search space. Um, you can't afford to run it on all pairs of things. And so you actually run it on a subset of the pairs that um, are going that have a common camer. And because we're building these hash tables, it'll be easy to look things up and figure out what has a common camer. So we'll call this generalized end body, which is a term that other people have used for this kind of pattern of sort of all pairs of things that, that come up, or actually it can be all triples or all whatever quadruples or whatever, but um, and we, uh, I'll say um, a little bit more about that, but this comes up also in our long read um, uh, overlapper, which is part of our long read Elba assembler. And um, let me not uh, talk about the um, camera now, the, the, that camera process there so much, except to say we clever, we have to be careful about how we choose these, um, the, the camera length and also how we choose things to find the overlaps. But what we're looking for is we're basically trying, we've, we've got a hash table say of the contigs and we're trying to find the subset of reads that align to each one of those, that could potentially align to each one of those, those contigs. And we'll do it by saying, we'll only assume that there's an alignment if there's at least one common camer between them. And so this becomes sort of a, you know, that naive n squared algorithm now becomes a sparse version of it where you're only going to align the pairs of things in which there's a common camer. And that's what's implemented in this um, bulk synchronous uh, and one-sided asynchronous version of this kind of all to all aligner. This is once again using CPUs. So this is somewhat older, an older graph, but is looking at the distributed memory performance and the communication cost versus the, um, for the, uh, the, the higher um, bulk synchronous, which is on the left of each one of these bars and the BSP one versus the asynchronous. And it's really that communication time that gets overlapped in the asynchronous case. And this is just showing kind of how you can think about the hash table now as a sparse matrix um, and actually turn this into a kind of a linear algebra operation or at least a, um, a matrix operation. And um, so imagine that we have, we're in, in what we're trying to do in this particular alignment problem for the long read case is find all pairs of input reads that should be aligned with each other. So this is gonna be a read by read sparse matrix that we're trying to compute. So we put all of the cameras for all the reads into a hash table. You can look at that as the left-hand matrix and think of it as a camera by read sparse matrix where we kind of kind of blow it up into that hash table into a matrix, multiply it times its transpose, and then we can get out the sparse read by read matrix. And this is actually what we're doing using things like the, um, the graph laws implementations to get um, highly parallel and in some cases GPU optimized versions of some of these sparse matrix kernels. Um, it also kind of looks at this idea of communication avoiding algorithms when you when you look at n body and I do have some papers looking at 
both the two-way end body and the multi-way end body problems looking at um, how to reduce communication in these. Um, the obvious way to do a, a sort of a naive end body calculation with, with um, just pairs of particles that you're looking at is to say, well, if I've got say 16 particles and eight processors, each processor gets two of the particles, I'll just cycle the particles around until every processor has seen every other particle and therefore can compute all the forces if you're doing a force calculation between every pair of particles, or in our case, every alignment that has to be done between every pair of reads. Um, but you can also actually replicate these um, initially and use something like a logarithmic uh, broadcast by making, but it's a little logarithmic here, where, where a, li a little one because we're making four copies in this particular picture. And, um, and then this, the, when we cycle them around, there are not as many cycles to do, as many steps. And you can prove that this reduces the number of messages by a factor of C squared, the number of copies here, and the volume sent by a factor of C. Now that's for the dense and body case, but you can also use these ideas um, in the sparse case as well. This is showing some speed ups for the dense and body case, just to kind of um, point out that it actually can, can really give you very substantial speed ups um, on, especially when you're running a relatively small number of particles on a large machine. And you may be familiar with this in terms of people talking about iteration, iteration space tiling and things like that, but the proofs of um, communication complexity are really, I think, what's, what's new about uh, this. And it's of course harder to do those kinds of proofs in the sparse case because you need to know something about the sparsity structure in order to get a non-trivial lower bound on communication and um, and then to give a um, an upper bound estimate of the cost. But there's interesting um, interesting work to do here, and this shows the the advantage of this sort of two-dimensional decomposition or two-dimensional parallelism in the um, long read to long read aligner versus the 1D version of it. And it also, um, this is now a bulk synchronous algorithm again. I will just mention that the bulk synchron the, the uh, matrix based algorithms very naturally fit into a bulk synchronous style. Um, there, there can be substantial load imbalance problems because of the sparsity structure of those matrices. And I think one of the open questions in my mind is can you write the code at a high level using these matrix operations, but have the code execute in a much more asynchronous style in which you do things like work stealing and um, other types of load balancing techniques in order to give you much better, um, much better performance. So that's an open question. And um, I'll just mention because I think, um, sorry, I think I'm really out of time now. So um, that we also do um, both unsupervised and supervised learning. And these also build on top of these communication avoiding ideas for, for matrices, in this case for sparse matrices matrices that come up in things like graph neural network algorithms. And um, I will, uh, I think at this point, I probably need to stop um, since we're out of time, but people, maybe the organizers can let me know if there's, um, if that is true. It looks like, yes, I do need to wrap up here. So let me just go to my final slide of takeaways. Um, from the applications perspective, we have um, you know, more data computing can give you better science. And um, these genomics problems are really dominated by seven of these motifs, most of which overlap with this National Academies report on the big data motifs or the giant seven giants of big data. From the architectural perspective, we're seeing a lot more data parallelism and, special, and starting to see some specialization. Communication will always be, I think, a very, a very important thing to um, continue to optimize and closer integration of the communication and the hardware is gonna be important. The algorithms in this case are very irregular and fine-grained problems, and, um, but you can map them onto distributed memory systems, including GPUs. And avoiding communication will continue to be a really important technique both hiding latency behind, by using asynchronous communication, but reducing bandwidth um, using things like these communication avoiding algorithms that replicate data. And, um, and I didn't talk about it so much, but in the, um, in the case of uh, bisection bandwidth problems where you're sending all the data around the machine to really try to make sure you're using the communication all the time, because that will typically be the bottleneck. With that, I will stop and um, I'm happy to either stop there or if there are any questions, um, I can certainly stand for a couple of minutes. Great, thanks a lot, Kathy. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand on Zoom and then um, I can unmute you. So uh, there's a button that says raise hand on the bottom of the screen. Uh, okay, so Yatish. Do you want to ask your question? 
Hi, Kathy. Uh, it was a great talk. Uh, I'm Yatish. Uh, I'm a new faculty at UC San Diego. Uh, so you spoke about uh, specialization and parallelization that can speed up computation. Uh, and it was a great insight to know that communication could also be a bottleneck in so many of these distributed algorithms. Uh, so what do you think is the way we will speed up communication in the future besides like just using communication avoiding um, algorithms? How do we do it from a hardware, hardware perspective? Well, you know, I think there's really interesting technologies that people are developing, whether it's 3D stacking or things like, um, you know, wafer scale computational platforms and things like that, which give you much more tightly um, integrated communication, if, at least at a certain level, right? I think that what, what it will change with some of these different technologies that is kind of where the big cliff is in terms of communication. If you're at the wafer scale, maybe you can get much faster communication across the wafer. If you have a really enormous computation that goes beyond that single wafer, then um, you may you know, you still are going to see a, a significant cliff cliff there. And I think, um, you know, on the software side, I'll just say that, you know, most of the latency that we see with communication is not hardware latency, it's not speed of light, it's software overhead. And so I do think that using much lighter weight hardware, well, software mechanisms built on lightweight hardware mechanisms that allow us to do things like have a GPU directly write into another GPU's memory across the network are going to be um, increasingly important or other kind of accelerator. But um, so I think I think tighter integration is going to be really important at the hardware level. And um, and I do think I mean, I think specialization will be helpful, but but I, I worry that we uh, over optimize for sort of the computational piece of the processor and don't think about how to make it scalable with integrated communication. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Adish. Uh, uh, yeah, Yui, you, you have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, so following up on this, and thanks for the talk, uh, first of all. Uh, very interesting. Uh, following up on, on this last comment, so you mentioned UPC++. Uh, how, what, what, how, how does that relate to your, your last comments about sort of lightweight uh, uh, software stack on top of specialized hardware, et cetera? Sorry, what what you, are the advantages you... in, in, in the context of the applications you, you, you presented? Um, so let me make sure I, I might have missed a piece of the question. So um, I think it was you're really asking what are the advantage of this tighter integration for these say genomics applications is that right yes and in yeah. particular with regard to upc plus plus right so you know i think that i i look at upc plus plus as a as a way of giving me convenient access to these kinds of one-sided communication features i can also get them in mpi sometimes they're not as well optimized and because it's really the focus of UPC++ and the underlying gas net model. Um, but that gets into kind of you know, the current state of software rather than being something fundamental. So the fundamental thing is really doing one-sided communication. And I think that in, if you look at something like building a hash table, it's really, it's really convenient to be able to remotely or perhaps better example is looking something up in a hash table. It's really convenient to be able to go over and just do a remote read in a very lightweight way. And we, we still find a, a fair amount of software overhead, which means that it's hard to, um, to do those fine grain. Um, and we, you know, we spend a lot of time doing aggregation and stuff like that of messages when we can. But if we could get those mechanisms to be really lightweight, then I think you could more directly run the more asynchronous algorithms, which would be a good fit for these problems that don't have, I mean, they're not dense matrices. They're not sort of structured grids. They don't have very predictable communication patterns or amount of time that it's going to take for a certain computation to run. So um, that's um, that's where we're, uh, I think that the, that would be the advantage for those kinds of problems. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I actually had a question about the programmability of these um, applications. So you mentioned a bunch of GPU optimized codes. I'm, I'm wondering like how, are, are those codes much more complicated than the CPU parts? And if so, are there any programming abstractions that an average programmer could use to more easily write these programs themselves? Or do you really need to be an expert in parallel programming to do it? Yeah, I, unfortunately, right now you you do need to be an expert in parallel programming to do it. I, I you know there are certainly optimized libraries for things like Smith Waterman alignment, um, but we found that they 
were not really suitable to the particular problem that we, in fact, there was a survey that um, a student did about the different libraries and what worked and didn't, but the use case where we had short reads, um, we had massive numbers of them, we, um, and, and we often didn't wanna run a full Smith Waterman, we wanted to run a banded Smith Waterman or something like that. Those were all things that really quickly narrowed down the space of possible implementation. There's, there's also the problem, I mean, which really highlights your the importance of your question of you know, versions of, for example, CUDA not being, not being backward compatible or forward compatible, I guess it would be, because we've got old software that, you know, a library that was optimized for a couple of generations ago and you can't run it anymore. Um, and we also, by the way, find that we're using, because we're looking at both NVIDIA as well as AMD and Intel GPUs, that exactly what features you have for things like um, being able to do masking and things, which are you know, really important in these data parallel algorithms, uh, are, are key to our efficiency. And so um, some of those hardware features, I, I don't, I guess the point is I don't wanna kind of program at the, you know, what, you know, the, for better or worse, the least common multiple of these sorts of programming or these, these architectures because, um, because I need to take advantage of, of those special features when they exist. Um, so, you know, my ideal though, is that we could write things at a much higher level, even across the parallel machine by using something more like these, these sparse matrix abstractions and have a sophisticated compiler that maps that onto both the GPU hardware. And we are building a code generator. Um, I know those of you, you know, there's people at MIT who've also built code generators for some of these genomics um, algorithms as well. I do think that's the way to go um, for, for these, uh, these problems as it has been for linear algebra as well, at least dense linear algebra. Great, great. Thanks a lot, Kathy. Thanks a lot. Um, I think there's a question from Shashank. So uh, yeah, Shashank, go ahead. Hi, Kathleen. So great talk. Um, my question is uh, regarding uh, um, the focus uh, uh, while solving the ge genomics uh, problems like assembly and all. So uh, basically, uh, you presented a view where parallel, parallel algorithms are, uh, uh, are, de are developed uh, or parallel techniques are developed, particularly in context of KML counting and, uh, you know, walks on the graph and all. But uh, what I believe, uh, it's not even, uh, I mean, I want to, I, I want to have your comments on that there's the inherent redundancy in the genomics data, right? Uh, for example, say NGS reads or long reads, uh, they provide, you, you cover every, uh, every character of genome by multiple reads, right? Because of there's uh, errors in the read. So there are many um, uh, uh, compression algorithms that are now coming to, coming to the picture. For example, FM index and BWT. Uh, there are many assemblers that are based on that, right? So any focus on parallelizing uh, the, uh, you know, uh, implementation of uh, uh, these alg uh, algorithms or let's say um, uh, uh, implementation or in developing the FM base index or uh, BWT, um, parallel uh, algorithm for developing, uh, uh, implementing a FM index or BWT. Is there any focus on your side? Um, because I'm coming from the part that in, even in machine learning, the, the focus nowadays is, in, is on reducing the training data using one short learning or less than one short learning, right? So right. Uh, instead of, you know, uh, yeah. So that's where I'm coming from, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so, um, so yeah, we're, we're not we're looking, not. I, we don't have an algorithm um, looking at the, uh, the, you know, paralyzing those compression algorithms right now. I think it's a very good point. And there is, as you said, there's a lot of redundancy in that input data which um, we use right now, you know, to make the assemblies uh, high quality. And so, um, but I think it's a, an, it's an important area to also look at as ways in which, I mean, this, the initial phase, the camera counting, I mean, some sense after you get past that phase, um, the data is quite a bit more, quite a bit smaller. I mean, it's basically the size of the output genome, um, except when you also do the, the, uh, the alignment, which is later. So there's, there's kind of a lot of the algorithm is basically at the size of the output, but there's a couple of phases that are the size of the input or worse in the camera counting for a little while, you've got some that blows up um, by, you know, up to a factor of K. So I, I think it's a, it's a good point, um, but you do need all the other algorithms to, to work with that as well. And um, so, yeah, I think those, those compression algorithms are a good thing to look at. And I think I do need to drop off as well. And I think it's time to wrap up, I'm seeing. So I really appreciate all the questions. It's been great. And thank you once again for the invitation.